It's good to have. Good to welcome everybody. And are you having fun at the uh, conference? Very good. Very good. Okay, so this is the Canadian managing in today's changing time session. So if you're in the right one, great. Now, first question. How many of you are Canadian? Maybe a better question, is there any non-Canadians here? Oh, there's a couple. Okay, well, welcome. It's good. We're a friendly group up in Canada. It's good to have you here. So here's the session. We got, uh, we got about 50 minutes, and this is what we're going to do. You're going to meet the panelists here, and then, uh, and then I'm going to give a few opening comments. And then we're going to have, I'm going to ask these guys some questions, and then we're going to open it up to everybody else. Is that fair? That's, that's the agenda that we're going to follow here. So first off, let's meet the, uh, meet the panelists. Scott McKinnon, tell us a little bit about you, Scott. Tell us where you're from. Tell us about your farming operation. Give us a little background. Okay. Uh, Scott McKinnon, we farm in East Central Alberta. Um, we've got two um, locations, one at Killam and one in Lougheed, a little bit east of there. Uh, it's my lovely wife, Candice. We've got three little girls, uh, seven, nine, and 11, and they're into every imaginable sport and 4-H and everything else. So we kind of farm as a sideline to when we're not chasing our kids around. <laughs> um, our farm's kind of doubled in size in the last four or five years. We took over Candice's parents' farm. Um, they run a John Deere dealership, um, so they kind of transitioned full-time into that. So when we moved up to the Killam Yard, our school in Lougheed had been closed. So we moved that up. We run about 400 head of cattle, cow-calf pairs, and we farm just under 8,000 acres, give or take. Um, do a bunch of custom silaging, a bunch of other custom farming for people, which is maybe foolish, but. Um, so we've been, yeah, that's our main operation. And we keep, a, we had some New Zealand people, couples working for us the last few years um, to run the cattle operation. And we're kind of transitioning that operation from like a wintertime calving thing into a, into a uh, April calving thing just to, to reduce overhead costs and, and expenditures of, of cash on people there. So uh, we're constantly changing and trying to balance everything out and still raise our kids and do all that. So what crops are you growing? Um, so wheat, of course, hard red wheat, canola, flax, yellow peas, green peas, maple peas. Um, Corn, we grew grain corn one year for the first time, and then ever since then we grow a grain variety and chop it for silage because it never makes it. Um, what else have I missed? There's, um, well, there's okay, so, a lot. And, and is harvest done? It is. It was not fun, but I don't think anybody had a fun harvest this year. But we, were, we can't complain. This is the one year we were kind of in the Goldilocks zone where south of us was too dry. They had nothing. The guys north of us were way too wet. And we had nice crops this year we just had a really tough harvest but i would say 95 percent of the crop in our little area is off and it's all tough and everybody's drying it everybody's drying great jerry stewart tell us a little bit about you put your phone away tom yeah. this is important yeah uh so jerry stewart's my name i'm from oxbow I can hear him. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Check. Here you go. Just, a hand. Just hand me a handheld. That's fine. No, that's this. It's like back in my rock and roll days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jerry, tell us about you. <laughs> okay, so I'm from Oxbow. And we have to turn this one on. Test. Oh, there we go. Oxbow, we, uh, that's right down in the southeast corner of Saskatchewan, just east of Estevan. Uh, many of you will know, know where that is. Uh, we're strictly grain. Um, we grow wheat, uh, durum, peas, lentils. I've tried chickpeas. I've tried coriander. I've tried caraway. Uh, you know, I've been at this, I, I, I think I seeded my first crop in 1979. I know I only look about 35, but... <laughs> You know, it's, it's been a while. Um, I started with 30 acres back then. And I hit the glory days through the 80s, and we all know what that was like, high interest rates and high costs. Um, I farm with my wife, Carol. We have three kids. Uh, they're almost all grown up now. My oldest just finished university. Uh, my daughter's in her third year, and my youngest is uh, back at home, hopefully taking care of the place, but he's 16. 
So maybe it won't be in one piece when we get home, but um, what can I say? Uh, you know, farming's been a, a great life. Uh, a lot of young people, when I talk to them, they say, you know, it's easy. You're, you're older. You've got lots of equity. You can, you can make this work. But I'll tell you, it hasn't been easy from day one. Um, I look back at some of my uh, friends that went into the oil patch, and uh, they took a different path. They were, they were making big money, and I think the, the, the key, if I'd have done that, I probably would have done the same thing. We would have made big money, but the key is, is to keeping it. It's pretty easy to make money. It's real tricky to hang on to it. Oh, so I'm kind of at the phase of my life where I'm trying to hang on to it. So, so what, kind of, what kind of crops are you growing? Well, you said, talk to your crops. Harvest is done, and you had a good harvest? Well, it's finished, but it, was, it wasn't fun. Yeah. Uh, I think we went right till the... Anybody know? November sometime, anyway. Okay. And, and, uh, no, it was a challenge. Scott, when did you, uh, when was your first crop? What year? My, the first crop yeah, I harvested? Crop. Uh, well, legally I was 18, so it would have been in 96. Yeah. But uh, I, we, uh, I ended up having a pretty big role in the farm right from when I was little. Okay. Like, I've, you know, I've been playing around longer than I should have. Okay. That's good. Okay, so, so, so you know our, our participants here. I've been asked to provide a few opening comments, and I, I'm going to do that and give you my perspective on the dynamic and, uh, well, come on in, uh, a changing world of agriculture. And I'm going to do that through a story. True story. It's uh, near the end of September this year, and I'm at a conference in Minneapolis. And there's an ag economist from a prominent U.S. agricultural university, a Chinese chap, and he gives a wonderful, wonderful presentation on China and U.S. agriculture. And as he is running out the door, I stop him and I said to him, do you know anything about Canada? And this is his exact words. Oh, yes. Quite a lot. You're in trouble. <laughs> so I followed up with him the next week, and we had quite a long discussion. And he said some things that, I, that were intriguing to me, and I thought you might find them interesting as well. We were talking about China. And he said, you need to understand, Kim, that to the Chinese, there's only two countries in the world, China and the US. You're nice people in Canada, but you don't count. It doesn't matter. He then said, there are over a billion Chinese in China, but there's really only one that counts, and that's President Xi Jinping, and you he is not the CEO, he is the COE. He is the chief of everything. <laughs> and you have pissed him off. And you will pay. And I said to him, so if we let the lady go, the Huawei CFO Meng Zhuangzhou, will that help? And he said, oh, yes, it will help. This is a personal friend. It will help, but it's not enough. There's a belief that your prime minister lied to him, and your former ambassador of China embarrassed them. You will pay. Remember what happened in Norway. And I went, OK, what happened in Norway? And he said, well, in 2011, the Norwegians promoted the Nobel Prize winner who was calling for political reforms in China, and there was no trade for seven years. You will pay. And he said, you know, I anticipate that your pork and your beef will be opened up rather quickly, and of course it was. But he said, Remember, it's all about China. They need pork and they need protein. I anticipate it'll be a long time for, car for canola. Now, I didn't really like what I had 
what he had to say. And I hope he is wrong. But I fear that he is right. We then had a discussion about how the world has changed and the importance of trade, especially trade for Canada. We are an export nation, much more so than our American friends, much more so than most of the world, countries in the world. At least 50% in a lot of our, our products and maybe even higher than that. And the rules, of, the rules of trade seem to be changing. We have operated for many years under rules. WTO type rules, but it seems that we are moving more to a power-based rules. It's nice to hear the Secretary of Agriculture today and where we made progress on U, UMSCA, what it, NAFTA 2 point, or 0 0.08 we would call it. Um, but uh, it, it's, it, it's good on that, but even there, we're still subject to president's executive orders. You look at China, they don't care about the rules. They will make the rules up themselves. You look at Saudi Arabia and what they're saying about our wheat and some of the things like that, they're not moving the lock. You look at, at the tariff situation in India and pulses and Italy and Durham wheat. We look at subsidies. Oh, don't we wish in this room that we had subsidies like they were getting in the other parts of the room? <laughs> I think we're envious of our American friends. Maybe we're at times envious of a Secretary of Agriculture who can walk into the Oval Office and talk to a president. <laughs> Not sure we could I'm not sure our Minister of Agriculture knows where the Prime Minister's office is even. <laughs> I'm envious. And you look at imports that are coming in here that aren't subject to carbon taxes and some of the other things. It's a changing world, is it not? And it is a little different in this room than it is in some of the other rooms that we're here. And we used to be able to count on our allies. I'm not sure we can anymore. Protectionism is strong. And we certainly can't count on our governments like maybe they can down here at times. Now, I'm painting a pretty negative picture, and I don't mean to do that really. But I think that we are operating a world where trade is changing where geopolitical issues are changing, where weather is changing, where markets are changing, and you are managing your way through that. Now, it is not all bad news. Look at the opportunities that we probably have in protein. We make, the, the, the world wants more protein. Nobody makes better protein than Canada. Our plant-based proteins, our animal-based proteins are good, great. We got the African swine fe uh, fever situation, which is huge. Major opportunity for the livestock sector. Probably not so good for beans and some of the other areas. But there's opportunities there. We look at the whole change in public trust. It's tough on us as Canadian farmers, but maybe we have an area that we can move some things through there. We have processing opportunities that I anticipate that we will be taking advantage of in the near future. And of course, we have some other trade arrangements that are, that are pretty exciting and going from there. So those are some of the opening comments, folks. Now I'm going to challenge these people and say, so what the hell are you going to do about this? And that's where I think our discussion can really be. So as we go into this, Jerry and Scott, first off, Jerry, we'll go to you. Are you seeing the world a little more challenging these last couple of years than they have in, in the past? Is, or is it clear sailing? Am I just a negative old bugger? Well, I'm going to take a bit of a different spin. Yes, all these issues are paramount to everybody. But you know what? For the last number of years that I've been in this game, there's always something. There's always some issue. You know, we've seen BSE in the past. Uh, um, lentil prices get to 25 cents a pound. And believe it or not, that used to be a high price, 20, 25 cents a pound. And all of a sudden, we get a strike in Vancouver. And we lose a nickel a bushel. 
Um, so the point I'm making is, to me, a lot of this stuff is noise. Uh, yes, China's important, trade is important, but folks, they're coming back on their own terms. And 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, I was in uh, Yorkton, I went to a biofuels meeting, and uh, Pioneer, Richardson Pioneer, I believe, put it on. And we all went there hyped up about biofuels. You know, we're going we're gonna to move the demand curve. And when the president, or not the president, but the, the head dude there, the head guy from Pioneer got up and he said, you know what, we don't believe in biofuels. We, uh, we believe that the future is in canola oil and for food. And you know what, there was just like an air left the balloon in the room. There was as many people in that room as there is here today, and I think 90% of them left thinking, oh, our problem's over. We can just grow food, right? So my point is, is that that was 12 years ago, and we just came through probably the, well, it is the best 10 years since uh, the, the, the 70s in agriculture, and we dropped the ball. We got complacent. We got lazy. And in that whole process, what's happened is our costs went from here to here, right? We're just like the oil patch. Three or five years ago when oil was 130 bucks a barrel, they were tripping over the money. They were paying bills three times because it was easy. Then all of a sudden oil drops down to 80 bucks a barrel and I jokingly said to a couple of friends at the hockey rink, well, by Christmas time it's gonna be 30 bucks. And they all laughed at me. Well, I was wrong, it was $28, <laughs> all right? But the point is, is that revenues dropped right off, their cost levels way up here. And to me, the, probably the biggest challenge that keeps me up at night is I see that. I don't know, we all talk about costs and we should know our cost of production, but how many of you really truly do know? And honestly, it's a moving target. But I, did, I just want to pull two numbers that I pulled out of the dark brown soil zone. Now you've got to remember that when the Saskatchewan government puts these numbers together, they take them from the top 20 producers in crop insurance. Okay, maybe it's not the absolute cream of the crop out there, but it's certainly a strong, strong average. 52 bushels an acre, 51 bushels an acre. That's what I should be growing. Well, I'm not there. And the cost of production on growing canola, $444 an acre. Okay? So I know damn well everybody in this room is somewhere between 350 and 500, maybe above 500. So do the math. We're at 10 bucks today, roughly. 40 bushels an acre, 400, you're not breaking even. What happens if we put a nine or an eight in front of it? So my point is, is I think we gotta start fixing our problems inside. Um, okay, so we're gonna get you into how you're gonna do that in a second. Okay. Scott, how do, how, how, how do you see the world? Is this challenging for you right now? Well, uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah, a, little a little bit. bit. I mean, I guess when we were younger, we, it was just work, get the yields up you know, manage that. My wife looks after most of the finance stuff now, which has really helped. You know, she came home from a degree and uh, worked in the ag industry for a while, came back. So that's really helped us being more on top of both things. But uh, it's really frustrating, and our, our thing has always been to just do, be as strong as you can, where you can be, because like you say, there's always gonna be something. Yeah. It's, it just seems like, it's not what's gonna happen, it's, it's just when, when and, and when, you know? So we're just trying to, uh, yeah, you can't get too worked up about any one thing or you'd never get out of the door in the morning. You'd okay. honestly... Okay, so now, now we're going to... Let, let's think here in the next... We've got to struggle our way through here. We're gonna, let's think five years out. What are you going to be doing, Scott, as you look at your operation? How will it be a different... Or what do you think will be different today or five years from today than it is today? What do you... Um, we've been shifting already in the last couple of years. The, the, the mindset was to shift three or four years ago, but it's really hard to change. And uh, we looked at some of our costs. We run a cattle operation as well, two operations, and it wasn't making money. We weren't sure how little money we were making, but uh, we finally got it figured out. We were spending $600 uh, per live animal on labor. It was killing us. In an oil field based industry, you got to pay these guys $30 an hour. They put in twice as many hours as they, as, as say, I would put in to do the same job, but that's what you get. So we decided. Quit calving them out in the middle of winter, do it in the spring. So we've been changing this out, um, and it's a continual state of change. And we just plan on, um, I was on a panel the other day, or a, 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 
a podcast and I said, you know, our farm in particular is as big now. We always strove to be bigger and bigger, not get taken over by the next big guy. I'm at a point right now, and it might be just a, level, a, a holding period, but I don't need to get any bigger. I just want to get a little better, make my life a little simpler, and make more money. So not, not bigger, better. When yes. you say better, what are the areas you're going to focus in on? Everything. You know, yeah. we've hired, we've hired, we came to FBN through our marketing guy who did, we've been with for almost 10 years. Um, I think I would be without an agronomist before I'd be without him, because that's one of the biggest worries that used to bother me. Um, and now I, I honestly don't worry about it. I, I mean, he's dealing with it as best he can. If China does or doesn't deal, whatever, we've got a plan because that was causing me not to sleep. Um, we've got an agronomist hired. We have, uh, we have everybody smarter than me, which isn't saying a lot, but we've got a lot of people <laughs> helping us do the things so I can go out and run the farm. Because you, if you try and do it all and you fail it, there's not enough room anymore yeah. to fail yeah. at anything. So do you, do you see yourself changing crops? We always, we, we, we have a, I think I missed barley in the last one. We run eight or ten crops all the time, which is quite a few. There's yeah. lots of neighbors that do it, but we, we just adjust what crops we predict will be in the, you know, we do a, a top a list every year. Ryan does it for us. We, uh, we adjust it while looking at the rotation and everything else. We haven't tried anything brand new. We looked at hemp. Yeah. The infrastructure wasn't there yet. Uh, they, there are new crops. And so just really keeping doing what you're doing, being tighter on every aspect of what you're after. That's where you're going. Yeah, be solid so that if something happens, you're not on your last. Nickel. And no difference in the livestock operation, about the same number? No, I promised my wife I'd cut it in half, and I've lied so far. It's really hard, <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on it. We're trying to get it down. We should be at 600 head for infrastructure, but the, the, the people we've had working for us have gone back to New Zealand. They were really good. I wanted to get it to a point where I could safely manage it for now, so we're going to get it down to between 250 and 300. Uh, if our kids take an interest in it, we can pick back up. Okay. But we're trying to maintain something that's at least feasible. You get any smaller than that for us, and it's not worth it. Okay. Jerry, what, are you, what, what as you look out five years, what are some things that you're you're looking at doing today that is different, or or, or that in five years that might be different than today? Well, building on what Scott said. He talked a lot about the agronomy side of things, and I think we have to really departmentalize our farms just like other big businesses do. You know, they have a sales department, they have a parts and warranty department, they have a service department, they have a, um, what's the other one, uh, maintenance department or whatever. And they all compete against each other, but I, I'm not saying we have to do that, but I think we have to look at each area specifically, and we have to get lean. We're in the commodity business, and if you've got a value-added uh, portion or part to your operation that's great but most of us are probably just strictly in the commodity business and in this world it's all about least cost you know the the Russians uh, all our competitors you know the Australians they don't care what it costs for us to grow a bushel of wheat or a bushel of canola so we have to be lean and uh, so I, I break it right down um, I'm a big big believer in technology uh, I've always been an early adopter, but I will caution you. I think there's a lot of snake oil out there. You really have to, to look at what they're bringing to the table. If so, make them prove it. And if it's making you value and saving you costs and increasing your revenues or whatever, you know, then jump all over it. And I think the people that really embrace that going forward are the ones that are going to succeed. And are you uh, farm size, bigger, smaller, uh, anything on that regard? No, I don't think you need to get bigger. Um, so you're the same as Scott, get better, not bigger. Yeah, actually, can I just read you something quick, just for the heck of it? As long as it's quick. It's quick. So I was trying to decide what we were going to talk about, so I, uh, I Googled what happened in the history, because often history has a tendency to repeat itself. So this was written in 1985, I believe, and it said, uh, as world demand increased, the price of commodities rose sharply. So that was the period from 1972 up until the late 70s. It seemed as though early surpluses, uh, or there was, there was no, uh, sur or, uh, sorry, it seemed as though the early surpluses that had so depressed farm commodity prices had disappeared forever. Governments, and industry people, whether implicitly or explicitly, said this is a new day for agriculture. The Secretary of Agriculture at the time said, farmers need to plant fence row to fence row 
to meet the growing demand. Farmers were buying high-priced land, buying big machinery, building large acreages. Land prices were running through the roof and farmers were chasing themselves. Does that sound familiar? Like the last 10 years, what have we been doing? So I don't think you need to get bigger. I think you need to look inward and say, okay, where can we make ourselves a low-cost producer? And I'll tell you, we've done a pretty good job on variable costs, some of our fixed costs, but that machinery component and the parts and the inflation, and now we're adding a carbon tax to it that I think is going to add 30 bucks an acre to the bottom line in the next two years. When we factor all that in, it's tough to get lean. So, so focus on lean. That's the area. No livestock for you. I have two horses, uh, two dogs, <laughs> and about a bushel of cats. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, that's good. Now, if, we, if, if, if the industry or the government could do one thing that would make agriculture in Canada better, what would it be? Go ahead, Scott. I think, and it's, this is pretty simple, but we've got two parties. You know, one gets in for four years, completely deconstructs what the other one did and goes too far, and then the other one gets in and deconstructs that, and I just wish if, if they could all get around a table and say, you know, we, we believe farming is important, we need to have it, just like our energy industry, whatever. Let's figure out what the, the core responsibilities are for a government. Let's develop that, and when we bounce from one party to another, we can change slightly the direction and the way we're gonna handle things, but quit flip-flopping back and forth and wasting half of our lives going back and forth and never and losing track of what's been going on. Because I see so much waste and so much wasted time. We only have so many years to do this, and it's completely out of our control. But it shouldn't matter whether you're a capitalist or a socialist. Um, you want to eat. You want those things. You want a hospital. Those, those things seem to be wasted. So get amongst... together and let's focus in on something that would move the whole country and the industry yeah. forward. No, and, and those things shouldn't be politically biased. They should yeah. just be basic beliefs that everybody should value. Jerry, what, uh, you're in charge. You're the man. Well, building 100% on that, I think the biggest thing that's troubling our industry from growing is our transportation system in Canada. We've been going around this mill for years, but how do we grow our industry when we can't really get what well, we do grow to market. And we have the same problem that the oil guys do. You know, they need pipelines. Well, we need pipelines too, but we need rolling ones. And we just can't get, we just can't get our product to market anyway. We need market access. And, and one further thing about uh, talking together and being on the same page. Personally, I think we have way too many commodity groups, and I know this has been going around. We got to get together and speak a common voice. Pick two or three of the top things and focus on it. And, and go from there. Okay. Good, good thoughts in that regard. Okay, spring will come. You get to do this all over again. When spring comes this year, what are you, are you gonna do anything different? I wanna know, what, what's your plans? What, are you, what, what crops, is there a difference in crops this year, Scott, than you were doing last year? Are you, uh, you're not taking on any more land? What are you doing with equipment? Give, me, give us some thoughts on what, what the spring looks like. Okay, well this last growing season, we cut our pea acres in half down, you know, which was a really good move because they were a bugger. Um, we, we tried to simplify this year. We, we said, okay, life's, life's getting tough. This is getting really hard to do. Um, how are we gonna make it easier? So we, we upped our wheat acres a bit, which a lot of our big neighbors are, are wheat and canola, that's it. And I don't believe that's quite the best rotation. So we upped our wheat acres some, upped our canola because we were able to in the rotation, cut our peas back. Our specialty crops, we're gonna grow less of them focus on them a little stronger, they'll do a better job with them. Um, we bought a new sprayer, just bigger, better again, just thought after this year we sprayed forever it seemed like. Um, yeah, and just trying to, um, we, we bought a, a, a big spin spreader with 120 foot pattern and section control. We went in this spring, we thought we were gonna be in a drought this spring. That was my gut, so don't ever believe my instincts. I thought it was gonna be dry, it looked dry. So we went in and put our normal fertilizer on, but when it got wet, we went out with this thing. It finally came, you know, the middle of June, it was just about too late and we put 20 pounds a year on, on half the farm. Every field got a half rate, and it was this particular year paid off huge in protein, yield, everything. So going forward, we're gonna really utilize that. Fertilize for an average crop and be ready to attack a big crop if you get rain. We're spread out over 100 kilometers. We're quite a big farm. I didn't really mention that. And geographically, we're spread out. So we're just trying to mitigate some risk that way, and never, but not be out of the game if you get a good year, because you only get one every seven or eight years, and you gotta be able to capitalize on that one. 
What about equipment? Are you uh, new equipment? Are you, or what are you doing with equipment? Do you lease? Do you? Yeah, we, uh, we got lucky. Candace's dad owns some John Deere dealerships, but we don't, we get the son-in-law price, which I think is a little <laughs> bit higher than everybody else's. We get leaned on pretty hard. I'm kind of the, the dummy that does the, the I'll, I'll get the first of something, and if it wrecks, then at least it's just me, and it, nobody else sees that. But um, we bought a bunch, we, we made a big move in, in, in 2012 when the dollar was par, and got everything new. Uh, we traded one more time, and then we've been sitting, we've just been slowly upgrading since then. We got into a good line of equipment. We really look after our stuff, have big sheds to put everything in. Um, but say, bought a brand new sprayer, a 120 footer, it's just all we can handle in the hills out there. But uh, yeah, the sprayer is huge, but we run, we run good equipment. Um, the seating equipment's gotta be good. Um, the best you can afford, we've talked about this before, the, before we sat down, you can run brand new, and you can run used, uh, they'll cost you about the same, but when you stay too long and used, then it costs way too much. So you just, every farm's different, you manage that to what suits your capabilities. Yeah. Jerry, how about yourself? What was it, this spring, what does this spring look like for you? Well, I kind of came off as a glass half kind of empty uh, approach there, but I'll tell you what, as long as I've been in this game, there's always been opportunities, and there will be before spring. You know, I think uh, you, you may get an opportunity to, to price some new crop canola at a good number, or wheat, or whatever, and I think if you're going to survive in this game, you have to be lean, but you have to be an opportunist. So we're going to play that by ear. Right now, my canola acres were scheduled to go up. Um, my seed company just switched over to a, a new way of bagging their seed, and I figured my seed cost is going up 30-some percent. So I'm probably going to pull canola right out of the picture at this point, uh, unless something, you know. But from that, it's, it's rotation that we're going to stick with peas, wheat, um, some type of oil seed, soybeans. Uh, machinery, we're good. Um, if the right numbers come along, we might try to stay current on a couple of pieces, but otherwise I, I don't need to buy anything. And, you know, I have to practice what I'm preaching here too, so. <laughs> okay. Questions from the audience. Who, uh, who wants to uh, challenge these, uh, these lovely gentlemen? Come on. Mics are out there. Shoot. Tom, you're for, you got the first question. Wow. Yeah. So the question was, there's been lots of consolidation, rationalization in the, in the retail uh, uh, manufacturer level. What impact has that had on your, your uh, farming operation? Scott, go ahead. Um, we've actually seen in our area, we're really lucky. We've got two, two rail lines, so both are there within, a, within hauling distance. We've actually seen a couple more grain elevators get built. Um, the companies that have been around, but they've built big terminals, so that's helped us. We're probably as lucky as anywhere in Western Canada for that. Um, other than that, it's, it's all, it doesn't seem like it's any different. It's always been going like this, you know? We've been, it's been consolidating. Now we're using, like, say, FBN. I'm pretty excited to see. I didn't even know all the things that were offered here, but as a way to leverage that back against the machine, I guess you'd call it, you know, the, to try and tip those scales and keep it even. Um, we all, I'm, I'm very much for small business in, in, in rural areas, keeping those towns alive. But if you can find a way to balance that, maybe you, you've got to survive as well. The best thing to help an economy is a strong, if all of our strongs are, our farms are strong, we'll put the money back in. If we all go under, that's not doing anybody any good either. So we're just, I, I don't think it's a big difference. We've always been playing this game. I know, I know if the John Deere dealerships had their way, there'd be one dealership in Alberta. Not, not the dealerships, but if the corporate John Deere, the same thing, they're being forced into that game. And, it's, it's not easy for anybody. Jerry? Well, I guess I'm just a, a little bit more cynical. Um, this whole industry is, is really not built on cost plus. It's built on what they figure the market will bear. And uh, my personal opinion is that things are going to get worse before they get better. Because you guys are all living on hope. I'm living on hope. And we're feeling a little bit of pain, but we're not feeling enough pain that we're going to see a structural change in the industry yet. And I think one of the biggest problems in that is we have too many oligopolies that are operating. We have two seed companies. You know, we really only have a couple of grain companies. They may have multiple elevators. And we're in a supply uh, abundant market. And in a way, it's kind of like pushing a rope uphill. And uh, we need true competition. Uh, 
to, to and more competition and more competition in this business, I think. And uh, um, I guess that's about it. Yeah. Greg. So the question was, as we've, they both touched on data management. Uh, Greg thinks it's going to be huge uh, growth opportunities in that area. What are your thoughts on data management? I've been, I've been doing a terrible job of it for about forever. And, and we've, we've been collecting data, trying to work through it, hiring people to do it. Um, I'm excited to see what FBN's platform can do. We've got the John Deere one. Um, it's always fallen by the wayside when you really try and crunch things up. Um, we've been collecting it for years, and I think it's probably one of the, the pinnacle of the things that we need to, to, to outsource, because none of us are tech enough. There are a few, but to really develop it and get it to be useful, um, I think we're all there, and it's to the point where people have actually gotten, in our area, have gotten less techy because they've been overwhelmed with this stuff. But I do believe all the information has been gathered in one way or another, and we need to start actually using it. And I see at these, at these presentations that they're actually starting to find ways to actually really learn from it and help each other see what's been going on because we've been just blinded you know we always say you've been the, collecting it you've been providing it are you do you have concerns about who owns it yeah but we haven't got to that on our farm we haven't got to that point yet it's all still in house um for sure uh with these networks so when you're when you're putting it out to the network to get benefit back there's going to be some give and take um i guess i don't have enough i don't think what i have is Anything that's going to set the world on fire, I guess somebody steals it. But I mean, eventually we'll start to realize what that entails, right? Yeah, Jerry. Well, in my area, um, it's probably some of the most inefficient land to farm. We have a lot of bush. We can't get rid of it really because of the can't get rid of the water. If I wasn't using data, um, weather stations, precision farming, um, my first uh, my first um, sectional control was the old Zinx 15, X15, when that came over from Australia. That's got to be 20 years ago. Um, if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't be farming today. It's all about using the technology that does pay, get rid of the snake oil, and use the, da the data that you can make good decisions with. I'll give you one quick example on that. Um, this year with uh, Fusarium and last year, we have these weather stations with weather models. And the weather model said Fusarium's not a risk. So we went in with a cheap product at the flag leaf and sprayed our cereals and, and relied on the technology. And for two years now, it's worked flawlessly. Mm -hmm. So we saved about 60, 70,000 bucks on not spraying uh, Corumba and things like that. So I'm a firm believer and that's what you need to do. And what systems are you using right now, uh, Jerry, to, to help you in that? What, what are you finding are good systems? Well. We started using a company down the states, and I don't want to throw names out there, but the the nut, the, the gist of it is is uh, it's a work order type program. So we wanted to engage not only my younger part of my family, but the people that work for us. So we send out work orders, they complete them, they do it on their phone, they put the data back. It all is keeps it in, in real time. And my real goal there was I wanted a better handle on inventory and all those things, but. I also wanted to engage everyone, and that, that was 100% success. So we do that. We use weather stations. Um, we've been in VR, variable rate, for, well, since Tom came along. Year, when, how, how many years ago was that with Echelon? And we've, we've taken, we've built on that, and we've, we've enhanced our zones with uh, EC maps and all kinds of things. So I, I kind of feel right now we're at about a 90-some percent uh, confidence level in our zones. So for the last month, my son and I and my wife, we've been out soil testing, 80 holes in a field. And we were doing it till three days ago, right? So that's kind of the stuff we're doing. Other questions? Are the precision farming prescriptions working for you, Jerry? Well, uh, 100% yes. Um, it's getting better every year. I'll give you some examples that maybe you don't think about. Everybody just thinks about fertility. Well, since we've gotten these EC maps, I have lots of these bathtub rings on the fields and, and areas that don't produce. If I'm going to grow peas there, I go out and I spend uh, 
10 minutes with my sprayer loaded up with authority and I spray those saline areas with uh, authority and uh, the rest of the field I don't do anything so I don't know what authority costs 15 16 bucks an acre so I might spray 20 or 10 acres in a field and we've just saved a pile of money doing it that way right or uh, targeted fung fungicide applications and I do believe that our, our variable rate maps are giving us more yield last year on the wheat we uh, we felt very good about the yield um, and this year it was drier and I was anticipating worse but we actually grew the biggest wheat crop we've ever grown this year and our protein levels were all 13.8 to 14.5 and we we had bad weather just like you guys and a week after that wheat was ready it was starting to get that lean to it and going down so I think we I think we did a bang on job on getting our fertility right because had it not been, it probably would have been standing straight up and the protein levels would have been off and stuff. But Any other questions? I'm going to ask the last one. We've been a little negative here. The circumstances at times are not necessarily that great, yet you've got, uh, Jerry, uh, kids are coming home to farm by the sound of it, and uh, Scott, you're, you're gearing up for your yeah. young guys. What makes you so darn optimistic, and why, why is the future looking good for you as you're looking out here? We uh, went to the local school this last, about a year ago, and spoke to a, you know, a, a grade 8 class. And one of the things we said to them, even in a small town, it's amazing how few people get to be on a farm anymore. And we had kids stick up their hand, you know, what's your favorite subject in school? What's your favorite thing to do? And they all had different answers, and we were able to, to associate any of their favorite things with something they could do in agriculture. And, and I think that really struck the kids that they didn't understand that that could be, right? If, you, if you're a techie, you love your remote control toys, go you know, start a drone company. There's, there's a million different things. There's always going to be egg. We're going to find a way. We always have found a way. It's a matter of finding how this, it's changed so much and it's still changing. We don't even really understand where we're at. So we're just, you've got to stay in it, stay current, stay positive, and do what you're really good at, outsource what you're not good at, and just keep moving with it and stay f afloat so you can be in it when it's good or find what is good. And keep having some fun. Yeah, some a little bit, they talk about work-life balance. It was a pretty bad cliche thing, but like I almost burnt right out last year. And I'm a pretty, I've always been a pretty hard worker and I find that's when we stopped. I just said, you know, this is crazy. I thought I was been doing a good job of being a dad and my kids are 11 years old and down and, and we, we do stuff with them, but not nearly. When you sit back and really look at what we were doing to build the place, it was like, Candace said to me, our kids are never going to want to farm if they see what you do every day if it doesn't change. And I didn't see that. So, and I don't imagine it's a lot different than anybody here, but you've got to balance that out somehow and survive. You, the level still has to be here. So, Jerry. Well, ditto's on it all. I, uh, one thing I would add, I don't want to be negative either because it is a great industry. Nothing's easy. You know, the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. You're going to have some tough times, but if you can pull through this next few years, and when I think things are going to get pretty tough, and I hope I'm wrong, but if it is, uh, you're going to come out much stronger and be able to make uh, great or have great opportunities in front of you. Just be ready to bounce on them, though, and make good business decisions. Don't do it from the heart necessarily. You know, make sure the numbers add up. And one last thing about family. Uh, we work way too much. I know that, but you know what? I've never missed one of my kids' hockey games, and... I've never missed a volleyball game, so make sure you take time to do that. So, yeah, very good advice, folks. I think we had a pretty good treat. Don't you agree? Right? Very good. Very good. <laughs> you know, some of the, some of the key key takeaways I, I I laugh with is that these are challenging times. These are times that are challenging our brain, our back, our minds, our heart. At times these are challenging times by the same token they're carrying through they're working together they're getting better not necessarily bigger that's a focus and I think I also heard that hope isn't a strategy <laughs> I think I heard that seems to me that if we can make it through these next little while here it's a little bit tougher and we're gonna get pushed here but maybe the times look pretty darn good ahead Seems to me that we are one of few industries, one of very few industries, which are a solution to many of the man times problems. Even our carbon friendly government in Canada, we are a solution to that. And when we start being able to 
be seen as being the solution and not the problem. And we have a job to tell in that whole area, but when we do that, then I think it could be pretty good in that whole area. So thank you, lady, uh, thank you, audience, for your participation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, thank you Jerry. And enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of the conference. Tom and crew, thank you. Thank you.